We tend to weigh ourselves in somewhat of a scale between Hitler and who's the best person you can think of, Mother Teresa, right? So there's our scale, the worst over here and the best over here. I surely won't be better than her, but I'm not going to be worse than him. Maybe over on this side somewhere in the middle. God says, that's not the scale that you're measuring. That's not my scale at all. My scale is absolute perfect holiness, no sin at all, nothing. And Teresa herself would have said that. So this opening lesson will kind of give us an orientation for you. And if you're like me, maybe you've been driving someplace and you're headed on your way, maybe even with a lot of confidence that you know what you're doing and where you're going, only to find out at some point you've been going the wrong direction the whole time. So that happened to me a few years ago. If, you, if I say these two street names and you've been in California for any length of time, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. But this happened to me a while back when I left a, 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 an appointment I had in Downey at a friend's house. And I, I, it was at nighttime then, and I'm heading out. I make a right-hand turn. I'm like, I'm so glad I have a good sense of direction. Unlike my sisters, we always joke about that. And I'm all misconfident about how my good sense of direction is. And I hang a right, and I keep going, and I'm like, this, this looks familiar. No, she, that, I totally remember this. This super duper looks familiar. This really, really does, huh? So why am I seeing Florence and Normandy? <laughs> oh, 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 Florence and Normandy. So I'm on Florence, but I'm heading toward Normandy. You can look it up later and find out why that's important. But I should have been heading the opposite direction back toward Whittier. After the O.J. Simpson trial, the riots that happened, everything, the, the epicenter of them was right there at Florence and Normandy. I did not, I was not there when it happened, uh, but it was close enough to it that it was still like nerve wracking to end up in that area. And so here I was with absolute confidence and a little pride about myself. Look at me. Like my sisters don't have as good a direction as me. I'm literally driving into danger zone with all the pride that I was doing it correctly. But here's what, here's the deal. You know, at night you turn and the lights around you and you can't see the sky. There's no stars to orient. And <laughs> And I got, I started, you're laughing, but I actually do. I can see the North Star. And then in Whittier, we have the mountains here. And we can see the mountain, like it helps us when we know where, where we're going and we see things that are familiar. And then we have, and then I had my pride that was in my way. Because I, were, I thought for sure, for sure, for sure, I was doing the right thing. And I was so excited to get home and tell my husband, I navigated home. I'm so proud of myself from this area. And I literally was heading into like the, the hotbed of do not be there as a white woman in the middle of that area, at Florence and Normandy. Again, look it up later if you need to. But th that was obviously a life lesson and a good sermon illustration, as they all end up being. So anything crazy that happens in my life, if you're involved, believe me, you're going to be names are changed to protect the innocent, but you're going to be in a sermon or a message. So I had gone way off course. And I was able to obviously write myself, and I'm here and have a good little story to tell. But our, our, as we begin moving into Galatians, I want us to go in with the exact opposite mindset as I had when I exited that house and head so confidently in the exact opposite direction. I want you to learn from that knucklehead behavior and come to Galatians today Thankful that God orients you in the right path, but not 100% confident that you are absolutely, you know you, you got this. You're humble, you're ready to be taught, no matter how much you've studied about Galatians or how little, you are just open and say, I will follow directions. I will check the manual, I will be on the right path. And uh, I believe that as we do that and get into the study, we are going to see God reveal things into our own life and heart and give us strong direction for that. And if you've been with us for a while, maybe even the last couple of years, you've enjoyed being in a couple great studies that have set the foundation for what we're going to be covering in this study. Uh, a couple of years ago, you see on the screen where it says 1 Corinthians, or actually Corinthians, and we went through one of other of Paul's letters, uh, talking to a, a church and we learned a lot about Paul we learned a lot about the Word of God and God himself and it was just a, a, a wonderful experience and uh, it's similar to Galatians Paul opens up this letter and kind of lights him up a bit <laughs> and gets on him. he's a little testy throughout C Corinthians not quite as testy as he is with Galatians but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute and then last year of course we had this big beautiful year moving through a massive amount of content through Exodus all the way through to to Deuteronomy, four full books of the Bible. Uh, we called it the rest of the Torah because we had done Genesis a couple years even before that. And so 
uh, you know, here we are today and we're getting ready to go back into the New Testament with all the things that we've learned behind us through that Corinthian study and that Corinthian study, uh, which was called Love and Light. And I originally, when I was starting to write that study, I almost called it Law and Love because it talked so much about um, the law. And it was such a great way to move from that to um to this study in, in Galatians b- by way of the Torah in Exodus and Deuteronomy. If you remember from our Exodus to Deuteronomy saved and set apart study, you remember that God delivered his people out of slavery from Egypt. And as soon as he did that, the first thing he gave them was a Bada bing! Good job, team. Way to go. He sets his people free. He delivers them from slavery in Egypt. And he didn't just set them free and say, hey, go on and live however you want. Right? He saved them and he set them apart. He didn't save them and set them wild. He brought them in. He gave them an identity rooted in who he was, his holiness. He set boundaries for them. He gave them a law that would define their, them as a, as a group and a people to shape them and to reflect his holiness. So we learned and we studied and we enjoyed all of that. And Oh, how did that get in there? That was my, my cute little dog. That was my adorable dog there. All right. So... <laughs> So there's my little Dela. So we <laughs> we want to make sure as we're going through this study today to not leave the Old Testament behind us. It's with us. We're carrying it with us and inside of us. And in fact, you've heard me talk before that we actually prefer not to even call it the Old Testament because what do we do with things that are old? We throw them away. We put them on Craigslist. Uh, we get, take them to the charities. We put them in the trash and all those things. And, and uh, we might have a tendency to see the word old and say, well, that's the Old Testament. And perhaps we might even hear people say, oh, I don't know, Old Testament. It's so this and it's so that. And maybe even a very popular megachurch pastor of the largest church in America at the time <laughs> might even tell us uh, we should unhitch from the Old Testament and we shouldn't even bring it with us at all because it creates too many barriers for new people to come to the Lord. And to that we say, Heresy. No, no. And it uh, doesn't matter how many books you've read or curriculum that you have um, purchased from that organization. We'll talk about that later, trust me. <laughs> so we will not be unhitching from the Old Testament. We co- don't call it the Old, we call it the Foundational Testament. Foundational Testament. If you like to take notes, that's a good one to start with. We are, we're never going to unhitch. Anyone who says, ah, the Old Testament, boo, I like Jesus, peace, love, and granola. No. We, we have the Old Testament, but we call it the foundational. In the same way, we would never remove the foundation of the church and expect it to hover up there. There are no hoverboards in the Bible. There is a firmly rooted foundation, and we are standing upon it. Thank God that we are. We're, again, we'll talk a little bit more even about that. So tonight, I want to talk about our connection to the Torah as we move into the New Testament. Why is it even called the New Testament? Why? And, and that's why it ended up being called the old, because Jesus himself said, this is a new covenant. I know, I, I tried to enter her in, and I, I did, and I don't know what else to do about it. it this, sig- this signal dropped. I know. So turn your audio on, because mine, mine crashed over here. So, um, or tell her to go on the YouTube live. So we... We, <laughs> this is so much fun to be interrupted. <laughs> so we, we have to have the foundation of the Old Testament, the foundational testament. And a great reminder for that is a quote that I'll, I want to share with you to help us to remember this as we move forward into the new. Jesus said to himself, this is a new covenant, which is what testament means. It's a new covenant in my blood. And then we might think, well, then that, of course, that's the old covenant. Of course it is. But it's really the foundational covenant. It's the linking covenant. It's the setting up covenant. Is the defining covenant. It helps us to see who we are. Otherwise, we're just this peace, love, and granola guy walking around with hippie Jesus. Hippie Jesus. No. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. And by new, we talk about the New Testament. By old, we say the Old Testament. The new is in the old. So it is in there, but it was just concealed in there. Those who experienced it, lived it live, didn't get that. But we do. We look through the Old Testament, and how many times do we have light bulb moments through the old going, wow, you know, Jesus, I see him here, I see him there, I see how this picture is Christ. And then the old is in the new revealed. So we study the New Testament, and we, it reveals to us the old. And we go back and we look at the old and go, oh my goodness gracious, that's amazing. The gospel's been there all the time. I mean, it's literally been there all the time since the beginning 
since Genesis. And we can start seeing that's why we would be anathema, really, to unhitch from the Old Testament. And so we're going to be careful about this. This is a quote, speaking of old, from St. Augustine, the founding father and, uh, and leader, um, who wrote a great many amazing things. And you might want to read a little bit more about him. But this is a great quote. And it uh, reminds us of the, of the old truth that this is. This isn't something new. It's it, back in the first or second century, I believe, is when he said that. So as we move through and we do make that connection to the Torah, I want us to see, really see, that Galatians does connect to the Torah. So I'm going to give you five ways that it does. We're going to see a lot more as we go through this study. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to fly through this portion. We're going to fly. And uh, so I'm going to put up bullet point and then a few ideas and then a bullet. We're going to end up with five bullet points total at the very last slide. It's going to give you all of the, um, uh, all of them. So take notes if you're furious at taking notes, but the slides will be available to you. And then the final slide will have everything summarized. So, um, you know, what I, what I try to do, and it's very intentional tonight to do this portion, is I, I try to just cast out there for you and trust where, where your heart, your mind, your ability to grasp is there, you're going to pick up what you can pick up from this. I think of it in somewhat um, like a, a decorator crab. How many of you know what a decorator crab oh, yeah. is? Yeah, they're such cute little creatures. Yeah, they crawl around in the bottom of the ocean. And unlike a hermit crab, which gets rid of its shell, has to crawl into a new one, this guy just starts adding things onto the shell that he has. And he, he, he's going around the bottom of the ocean. I'm like, this looks cool. I'm going to stick this on. I'm going to attract a little girlfriend with that. Oh, look at this. I'm going to stick this on. it. And then by the end, he's all covered in all the things, you know, and he looks like the sale bin over at the thrift store at the end of the day. But he's, he's decorated himself with all this stuff. He didn't put every single thing on on his body oh look at that squid I'll stick him on me no he just picked the things that would serve his purpose and that he could put on and I want you to do the same you're going to be decorator crabs I'm going to send a lot out there for you and just pick what you can and stick with it and uh, we'll move on from there so don't worry because it's going to go fast are you ready buckle up here we go point number one remember we're connecting the Torah to Galatians number one the purpose of the law is revealing our sin and our need for the Savior revealing our sin and our need for a savior. So in the Torah, we saw that the law was given to Israel through Moses in the Torah, Exodus, Genesis, actually through Deuteronomy are the first five books of the Old Testament. And in that area, we see that God sets apart his people for his holy purposes. He shows them how to live holy lives. We heard that word a lot, a lot, a lot, especially in Leviticus. And but we we learn through this, and hopefully you grasped this in our study last year, that the law was not intended to save, but to show us our sin the law was not intended to save us from our sin but to show us our sin was the law intended to save us no, no. what was it intended to do it was intended to show us our sin exactly so we we see the need then for God's grace in our life if we see it that way and so when we move into Galatians we see um, moving into the new covenant, Paul echoes that truth in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, when he says, So the law was a guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. It was the, guard, the law was a little teacher for us, like a little kindergarten teacher showing us our ABCs. The law was a nanny. The law was a babysitter, right? And it just was a guardian to guard us until Christ came. Has Christ come? Yeah, Christ has come. We have Christ, right? And so he stresses that the law shows us our sin, does not save us from our sin, and that only faith in Jesus can do this. So number two is we have freedom in God's covenant relationship. Freedom in God's covenant relationship. Where is freedom found? In God's covenant relationship. All those words are intentional and very important. If you're married, you know this. Do you have freedom in your marriage? Yep. Do you have freedom to go date anybody you want to now? No. Nope. no. Do you have freedom to do anything you want on any given day? No, no, you do not. You are in a covenant relationship and you have to take that partner as a part of your covenant and be in that relationship with them. You have freedom, but it's inside the definitions of the covenant, right? And the same thing goes with our covenant relationship with Christ. In the Torah, God gave freedom to his people. He freed them from slavery from Egypt and gave them a calendar. We know that. He established his covenant with them. And this freedom was not so that they could just live however they wanted. It wasn't that kind of freedom. But it was free to serve God, free to be holy, 
free to be an actual nation, free to be set apart. And in Galatians, Paul addresses them and he says that they were being led into legalism and he reminds them in chapter five, verse one, the verse you memorized, right? It is for freedom that Christ has done what? He has set us free and he goes on to don't go back into bondage then, right? So just as God freed Israel, To serve him, we are free in Christ, not to return to the bondage of legalism or sin, but to live in freedom of grace and obedience to God. Number three, faith and the promise of salvation. So in the Torah, we see God's covenant with Abraham was given before the law was given. If you know your timeline, you know, you know, you can think of Adam and Eve and maybe jump to another familiar name, Noah, and then maybe another guy, Abraham, father Abraham, right? So he comes before Moses, about 400 years or so before Moses, and God starts a covenant with him. And that covenant was represented through an incredible moment where God uh, has him cut open a, a bull and a few other animals and this bloody scene and then God walks between do you remember that scene from our Genesis study God walks up between and he ratifies that covenant and Abraham's asleep the whole time (laughs) basically giving us a picture of you got nothing to do with this I'm the one who's going to make this covenant happen with or without you and he does that right then and there and in addition to that it gives him another outward sign of that covenant that Abraham was asleep for and that outward sign was circumcision so we're going to get to know circumcision a lot it's not a fun thing to talk about so (laughs) We're going to move in on circumcision this year and understand that even more than you ever thought possible. So (laughs) here we go. So in Galatians, Paul directly ties this promise to the gospel, showing them that Abraham was justified by faith. Abraham was asleep when the entire covenant was established. He couldn't have done anything out of works. He was asleep during it. (laughs) Okay. Did anyone sleep through their wedding vows? No, you both stood there and exchanged your rings. You were not asleep. You were awake, I hope, (laughs) for your wedding vows. Abraham uniquely was asleep during this particular vow ceremony. But he did take on the circumcision, which was that outward sign. Again, we'll talk a lot about that and other ways we have outward signs. So Abraham then was justified by faith, and so are we. We're justified by faith. (laughs) The promise of salvation comes through faith and not through works of the law. And that's not a new story. That is an old story. That is the way God originally set it up. Number four, the danger of legalism. Danger, Will Robinson, right? Danger, danger, and adding to God's commands in the Torah. So throughout the Torah, God warns his people not to add or take away. And you would think, That seems like a simple thing to do. I mean, just here's the law. Just do it. But what do they do? Well, let's do this and let's try that. Let's touch this and let's fix that and let's tweak this a little. I want little creative ideas on how this could go. If there's one thing we learn in how God set up that temple is there was room for us to bring everything there, but God had the exact design of how that temple was originally was actually going to look, right? Remember that? And he said, hey, everybody bring your good stuff and let's make a beautiful temple for the Lord and, and gold and your silver and your bronze and your jewels and your fabrics and all these beautiful things. They came there and he had the exact detail down to the mm, smallest unit of measure from back in those days to exactly how it looked no creativity there it had to follow god's exact plan do not add from that do not take it away do make it larger than it needs to be don't make it smaller than you need to be do you understand that our study through exodus through deuteronomy is now completely setting the groundwork for us to understand galatians and this idea of the law don't add to it don't take away severe consequences back then severe consequences now and your life is at stake it really and truly is and we do have a tendency even though we don't think so and we think oh that's probably other people in some other religion but we do in our own heart have a tendency to want to add Add or take away from what God has commanded us to do. And so I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your own heart. Am I doing that? God? I go to a really good church that teaches the gospel. I, I surely have learned my lesson on that. I, you know, do like John Donne did in, in the poem, the sonnet that he wrote. Batter my heart, three-personed God, he said. Beat me up, John Donne wrote. Right? I, I don't want to be a slave to anybody else but you. And so we have to come with that level of humility because as I study, and I'm only saying this from absolute personal experience, I left that house very confident I was going in the right direction and proud to get ready to share the story with my sisters and my husband. And I was going into severe danger had I not gotten on the right track. So is there room for all of us to be humble and say, all right, I think I know what I know, but maybe I don't know what I think I know. Maybe need a little humility. 
Woo! Certainly convicted me as I read through this. I hope it will as you for you as well. So in Galatians, Paul addresses the Galatians because um, <clears throat> they were being led to believe that faith in Christ was not enough. And again, you know, or you can be like me sitting there going, I would never think that. Careful. Florence and Normandy. <laughs> Faith in Christ is not enough. They needed to follow Jewish laws like circumcision. Well, I certainly would never do that. I don't got the body parts for it. So, I mean, there, but I have other things that I could potentially be doing. I have to have the humility to think, oh, I could have been heading to Florence and Normandy on this. I could be thinking in so much confidence, right? So he firmly declares that adding anything to the gospel of grace distorts the truth and leads to what? Bondage. It leads to bondage. Okay, so number five. Living as God's set apart people. Living as God's set apart people. So the Torah set up for us that the law called Israel to live um, reflecting God's holiness in a way that they worshiped and they worked and the way that they treated each other. And Galatians, along the same lines here, Galatians, Paul speaks to the new identity of the believers as set apart through faith in Christ. In Galatians 3.28, he emphasizes the unity of believers, whether Jew or Gentile. If you're a Jew, everybody else is a Gentile. If you're a Gentile, you might think, well, there's a whole bunch of other people around here. You got the, you got the Chinese people, you got the people down in South America, you got the people in Canada, America's hat, and you've got the people down in Mexico and all these different people. And that's not how the Bible describes things. It just simply categorizes it. Either you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. And the Gentile is every single other nation. It's just a big category. I'm a Gentile. I mean, you might have done your DNA and found out like, Rachel, that she's <laughs> a little bit of Jew. <laughs> and I love that. It's beautiful. So we are called to live as people, um, God's people, no longer tied to observing the law, but fulfilling this is by walking in the Spirit. It, it, that you, we can't. That's why this study is called free and filled. Free and filled. They're not free to just wander around, do whatever we want, because we are a sorry lost mess heading to Florence and Normandy. We are filled with the Holy Spirit to redirect us and get us back to where we need to go. Amen. Amen. And there's all five for you right there. All right. And then these slides will be available if you want to go online and look them up later. I'll put them up on the, on the you know, Bible study website. So as we transition uh, to Galatians, the theme of law, the theme of freedom, um, uh, Paul's tone, not unlike in Corinthians, is pretty sharp at the beginning and throughout. Um, but it's really urgent. And uh, Galatians is... Paul, really at his most passionate in his first letter, which was probably written just a few years after Jesus' uh, death, um, is Galatians, the first letter. It's not, it's not lined up like that in your Bible. If you have the chronological Bible, it's cool, but they will insert it into Acts. And in this study coming up, you're going to go into Acts and see how Galatians fits in. You're going to have some time to figure that out and see. Uh, James was, was uh, the first of all the books of the New Testament um, in terms of the letters written, and then we have Galatians. So that's an interesting, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about James as we go through it as well. So he's dealing with these Christians who have this question, like, how exactly are we saved? And it couldn't be, it couldn't just be this. And so they start decorator crab with their religion, putting everything back on it, right? Or taking things off. Anyway, <clears throat> so if you've ever wondered if you are good enough, Julie's like right there with me. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a 12-year-old at heart, really. So um, if you've ever wondered if you are good enough, if you have ever worried if your efforts ever measure up, then this letter is for you. And so that... Okay, pause right there. That's not, that's not good news. So we could leave right now. You'd be like, oh, yay, I'm going to be told I'm good enough. No, you're not. Opposite. If you have ever wondered if you're good enough, you're on the right track. You're not. <laughs> if you've ever worried if your efforts measure up, good path. You're not. They won't. Forget about it. There it is. Right? And so here's, here's our challenge. Here's our challenge. I, I want to hear truth. I don't want to end up in the wrong place on Florence and Normandy because I listen to my dumb heart. I want to be redirected, even though I was, my pride was at stake. I don't want to be able to tell my husband I was doing this, that, 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 and tell my sisters. No. I, I'm not good enough. And you know, here's the deal. That's, it's so beautiful about the Gospels. We're not left with you're not good enough. We're not left with you don't measure up. We get Christ. 
Everything that he did, his entire righteousness, everything he lived is imputed, good Bible word, there you can write that down later, imputed to me as righteousness. Thank God I'm not good enough. What a miserable mess I would be. And we'd all be. Thank God he was. And I, I love the way that we can reframe and reword and understand Paul's fire, but I also really love a couple of paraphrases of that opening few verses. And I went ahead and found those, and you will not see me ever studying from either of these two Bibles, but they're really great for paraphrasing and helping us catch the, the vibe on it. The first one's going to come from the Message uh, uh, Bible. And so if you want to look in your Bible, it, it, Galatians chapter 1, you can follow along in there. I'm going to read it right out of that one. But in the Message Bible, he words it like this. I can't believe how you waver, how easily you've turned traitor to him who called you by the grace of Christ by embracing alternative message. It's not a minor variation, you know. It's a complete other, an alien message, a no message. I love that. It's a lie about God. Those who are provoking this agitation among you are turning the message of Christ on its head. Let me be blunt. If one of us, even if an angel from heaven, were to preach something other than what was preached originally, let him be cursed. I said it once, I'll say it again. If anyone, regardless of reputation or credentials, preaches something other than what you received originally, let him be cursed. Is there, is there, right? Is there any reason... And in, in you can, whatever, you, you know, reason why you want to come up with, I'm going to answer the question now. No, there's no reason. But here's, the, here's my question. Is there any reason why you couldn't be that forceful, that strong, that powerful, that convicted, that willing to speak the truth? The answer is no. And any other answer beside that is your own silly goofiness and your own unwillingness to admit the fact that you don't have the words yet and you haven't been in the word and you're not studying the word to understand it better enough to get your mouth ready to speak the truth into someone's life and to have the courage to go ahead and say it. Listen, people's lives are at stake. This isn't comfortable because hell is not comfortable. <laughs> and so we're going to speak the truth. And we're going to love people through it. And you're going to see a little bit more about that. Check out J.B. Phillips. This is my dad's favorite paraphrase. And he says it like this. I'm amazed that you have so quickly transferred your allegiance from him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. I love how this was written in the late 50s. And he uses air quotes. We thought we invented air quotes. Look at that. Another gospel. And of course, no. It, no. This would never could be another gospel. But there are obviously men who are upsetting your faith with the travesty of the gospel of Christ. Yet I say um, that if I or an angel from heaven were to preach to you any other gospel than the one you have heard, may he be damned. <laughs> you shouldn't talk like that. That might hurt someone's feelings. Silly goose. You have heard me say it before, and now I put it down in black and white. May anybody who preaches the other gospel than the one that you have already heard be a damned soul. Does this make you think now that I'm serving man's interests or God's? If I were trying to win human approval, I should never be Christ's servant. Ooh, wow. Maybe, maybe switch to decaf, Paul. <laughs> Right? Can I get an amen? Somebody asked me this morning, and I gave the same message this morning, of course, is how many cups of coffee did you have? I said, believe it or not, a half. You want to see me fully am, but you're going to caffeinate, caffeinate me right up. All right, here we go. So we're going to move now into the key theme of uh, Galatians, and this brings us to freedom. Freedom. But it's not, of course, just any type of freedom. It's the kind of freedom that the law could not offer, but only Jesus can. And we learned this in Exodus through Deuteronomy. The law set boundaries. It set expectations. It set the people of Israel apart. And in Corinthians, we saw how love fulfills that law. And here in Galatians, we're going to see what it means to truly be free. Not free to do whatever we want, of course, because we remember we're in a covenant relationship. Right? So we're not free to do whatever we want. We are free to live as God has called us with his spirit filling and not bound by legalistic expectations of our own efforts. So we are free to live as God has called us. We are free to be filled with his spirit and invited to be filled with his spirit. And I will just pause right here. And if you find yourself at any point in this Bible study confused, not getting it and beating your head against a wall because you just aren't understanding this, I'm going to ask you to pause and invite Jesus to say, Lord, I am not, I, I need your wisdom here. I need the Holy Spirit. And if you've said yes to Jesus and received him as your savior, if you've been baptized and you have acknowledged Jesus as the Lord of your life and surrendered your sin to him and said, I put you in charge. I don't want, I'm off the throne, Lord. It's all you. Take it away. Uh, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, <laughs> she's going to resist that one. If you have done that, you have the Holy Spirit. You have access to that. 
And uh, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, then it's time for you to bend the knee and do that. And you might feel like you have because you love the whole idea of Jesus and you have a Bible or two and you go to a church and you have friends who do and all that good stuff. But if you not really actually, it's like going to a marriage. You don't just stand there and let him do all the vows. You got to say, you got to say the vows back. And you got to live them out. You got to put the ring on. You're married. Act like it. And uh, then you get the infilling. You get the Holy Spirit. And so if you're struggling with that, I, I want to talk to you. I want to help you understand what, what the Holy Spirit is to offer you. It changed my life when I started realizing I was reading the Bible without the invitation of the Holy Spirit. I had the Holy Spirit, right? But I, I, didn't, I didn't have that invitation mentality about, oh, Lord, I'm so humble. I don't understand this. I, I give you the right to uh, help me understand. And uh, I, I trust that you will. In my time, I don't understand everything today, but I'll, I'll understand more than I did yesterday, and I'm just trying to be humble about that. And I'm not bound by legalistic expectations in my freedom. And this one is, I think this is the hardest one for me because I just don't see myself as someone who's bound by legalism. And I, again, don't relate really close and personal with circumcision, but I kind of get the idea of what that all looks like. And so this whole legalistic expectation thing, I'm like, well, I guess I'll just get to the other parts until the Holy Spirit convicted me. Because I grew up in a home that we, my parents really worked on trying not to be legalistic. They had come from very legalistic upbringings. As good as my grandparents were to raise them in the, in the word, very legalistic. Oh, I better not do that. Christians wouldn't play cards. Christians wouldn't chew gum. Why? Because it looks like you're chewing tobacco. That's legalism. Oh, Christians wouldn't, Christians wouldn't, oh, but they, all the thing, all the, they wanted to get away from that. And, uh, and so I, I really felt like I was not legalistic until the Holy Spirit convicted me that I had my own form of it, my own way of doing that and putting those expectations on myself or, or on other people because it's not my own efforts. I have to go back to the Lord. It's all about him. And if I, if I uh, find myself discontent, unhappy, um, wavering in my faith, any little issues like that, it always goes back to this. I, I'm missing it. Somehow I'm not tightening that up and I need to get that back and tighten that up. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, Galatians and the just the idea who you know where are we in, in the world and in history you're going to do a little more of this study on your own as you get into this particular lesson too um, but Galatia is a, a region it's not one church Paul's letters were written to one church Thessalonians or one guy Timothy but Galatia is a region in an area called Turkey that we have today and so it's not one area, it's um, a, a bunch, several churches that are in that area. And Paul wrote this letter. The Greek word for that is epistle. Um, and so he wrote this to be circulated among all those churches. So it wasn't just one church. You got to read the fire of Paul when he, they got it. And it was written in this area. There would have been Jews and Gentiles. And it was written to people who already said they believed in Christ. They didn't need the, they already received the gospel. They were already at church. So these were churchy people. Well, that's you. That's me. <laughs> that's, all, that's all of us. We're those people, right? So I don't want to, we have to be careful. I'm only saying this because I had to learn this too. Don't like, oh, no, those guys out there being so legalistic. I'm legalistic in my own way. And so I, this book is for me to tighten it up my theology and understand things uh, better as well. So the theme of Galatians, I, although we talk about freedom, this freedom is rooted in this truth, and this is what I want us to understand over and over again, is the sufficiency of the gospel. The gospel is sufficient. If it's not sufficient, we got a big problem, and we got to better start working at, at that. And uh, so it's, the addressing of the issue comes in two forms. Uh, we're addressing the issues of faith isn't enough, and the issue of that circumcision is required. You got, surely you got to do something to get this huge, big bonus gift. Nobody just walks around giving stuff away for free. And, and yeah, Paul's like, yeah, no, God does. <laughs> Faith is not enough. Yeah, it is. Circumcision is required. No, it's not. All right? So he answers the issue. He addresses the issue, and he answers the issue. And he says, oh, quite simply, the answer is the gospel. You don't know the gospel. You've converted and perverted and twisted and added to it or taken it away. You, you left the gospel. <laughs> you need to get back to the truth of what the gospel is. And the truth is very simple. It's by grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone, period. Done. That's it. There's two more, but we'll talk about those later. Like These are called solas. Uh, they, they, it was a, it's a Latin word for only. And uh, by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Don't add to it. Don't take it away. Keep it simple. That is the theme. And we're going to talk about how powerful and amazing the gospel is and why if we could get back to this, you will have the courage to talk to the person that's difficult to talk to. 
You will have the, the, the wisdom inside of you to discern things and understand things even better for yourself. So Paul is writing this letter in response to a crisis that's very urgent and out of the gate, they've twisted the gospel. And I'll tell you right now, out of the gate, that's exactly what Satan wants people to do. Because he doesn't need to erase God's word. He needs to twist it just enough. Just enough. Because it kind of feels right. And it does feel right. You know why it does? It's religious. Oh, I'm, certainly God wouldn't send religious people to hell. They're so good. They do all the right things. They go to church on Sunday. They carry their Bibles. They know a verse or two, right? Oh, huh. He's very happy to twist all that and keep you satisfied that you go to church. Look at you. Aren't you great? Guess who else went to church? Evil. Hitler. <laughs> He probably made his mom cookies, too. He's probably, you know, like, <laughs> right? But that's what we tend to do. We tend to weigh ourselves in somewhat of a scale between Hitler and who's the best person you can think of. Mother Teresa, right? So there's our scale. The worst over here and the best over here. I surely won't be better than her, but I'm not going to be worse than him. Maybe over on this side somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and God says, that's not the scale that you're measuring that's not my scale at all. My scale is absolute perfect holiness, no sin at all, nothing. And Teresa herself would have said that. I don't have, I would never match up, all right? So Paul's writing this because he needs to write this ship. He needs to get it set straight. And he does a pretty good job of it. And so who is this guy and why does he have the right to write the ship? Why does Paul have the right to even speak like this, to raise his tone? Not everybody does. You know, I wouldn't show up at a woman's retreat. Someone invited to me some, you know, random fill in the blank church and show up and probably talk like this to them. But you, we have a relationship together where you're inviting me in. I'm inviting you into my life. And so we speak like this to each other because we're concerned and we, we, we want the reputation of this church to bear the weight of who Christ himself is. And so who is Paul? Why does he have the right role for starters? Paul's Hebrew name is Saul or Shaul in Hebrew and uh, Paul is or Paul in Greek. And some people think, oh, Paul had his name changed. Isn't that cool? Kind of like Abram to Abraham and Sarah to, uh, to Sarai to Sarah and all that. Nope, no name change. When he was talking to his Hebrew buddies, he was Shaul. When he was talking to his Greek buddies, he's Paul. It's the same, just, you know, different people. And it's kind of like me growing up. Uh, my, my dad used to call me Jeff. I, I didn't have a name change. It was just a nickname my dad called me. But when I was with my family, my dad would call me Jeff. And uh, my, my mom and my sisters would call me Jan. My Aunt Lena, every now and then you'll hear her refer to me, and you'll, it's Jan. And you're thinking she's saying Jen, but it's Jan. J-A-N-A -A was my given nickname. And so when I'm with family, I get Jan or Jen or, or Jeff with my dad. Because my best friend in high school called me Jeffner. And so he thought that was funny, and so he started calling me Jeff. All right. So uh, <laughs> that's who Paul is. And he went from persecutor to preacher to planning churches. And don't you think I was happy when I came up with all three P's on that one? <laughs> I mean, I am a PK. <laughs> Hey, come on. So, yeah, we've got Paul. We've got the three Ps. And he was a persecutor of the church. He becomes a preacher, and he starts planning these churches. He also wrote letters to the churches and people. Uh, 13, if you count Hebrews, some people do. Um, he is, is 14 on that one. All right. And so I came across this really great um, illustration of, of Paul's name by a, a man. His name is Dr. John Gerstner. Uh, he's a theologian. Uh, Bible teacher, pastor, and I, I loved it. It was such a great way to remember Paul and what, we, what he was all about. So P stands for he, he was polluted by sin. He was polluted by sin, and Paul would have been the first to admit that he's the chief among sinners, he says. He was polluted by sin. A is for apostle with a capital A. Um, anyone can be an apostle with a lowercase. It just means sent. I'm sending you off into doing something, uh, running an errand for me, whatever. You're my little apostle, lowercase a. Um, but uh, Paul was capital A apostle, along with the other 12 disciples who remained, not obviously Judas. Um, so, but they were all apostles, also capital A. And um, that just means someone who was sent with a message from someone who had the message to be sent. And that's what Paul is. He was you for uncompromising. And uncompromising is such an important concept is what I would like us all to be. But we've learned and have it force fed down our throats. We should be compromising. And we should give in. And we should play nice. And we should get along with everybody. We should be compromising. It's a very high quality to esteem to. Sure, if you're working on a poster project in your science class and you're in seventh grade. But by the time you get out and you're not doing that anymore, 
and you're talking about things that have life and death consequences, do not be compromising. Don't give an inch. Don't. And Paul didn't. He was uncompromising, Paul. And you might think, well, uncompromising people there, you know, you could be kind of a jerk if you're uncompromising, mm-hmm. can't you? You're kind of mean and, and, and you're harsh and people aren't going to like you. But if you read his letters, you know what? They're filled with love. They're filled with love. Paul was uncompromising, but he was very loving because it is the highest example of love to not compromise on something that important. You were uncompromising as you raised your child. You do not compromise on important things that risk their health, life, and safety, right? You don't compromise that. It's not because you're mean. They might say you are. I hate you. You're so mean. Blah, blah, blah. No. You love them, so you tell them the truth, and you will not compromise. So Paul has the right to say this, and we'll learn a lot more about why he has the right even more in this particular study. But the heart of Galatians answers some pretty significant questions, and it's a question that has to be answered by everyone, ultimately. It's an answer that every single religion that exists tries to answer, and the answer is simply this. What do I need to do to be accepted by God? Even if you change that capital G to a lowercase and you become your own God, you have to accept yourself. So even those types of religions have to live with that type of answer and somehow get to that. What do I need to do to be accepted by God, whatever that looks like, or God, if it's me, right? You have to find an answer to that. And we will see that throughout um, throughout Galatians. What do I need to do? Do I need to add anything to fix the gospel up and make it more complete? Do I need to do any of that? And again, every religion has to somehow address that and every religion comes up with their version of an answer. You're going to dig into that a little bit in this lesson ahead. But the answer quite simply is no, nothing. (laughs) Nothing more, nothing less. Jesus is enough. That's it. Do you need to do anything to be accepted by God, we're going to find the exact answer to that, what what God requires for that. And um, the answer is is simple, and that makes it a little hard to believe. Interestingly, belief is a part of it. So as we move through our Bible study, I want us to make sure we are studying well and faithfully. And so I'm going to give you a quick acronym just to help you tighten up how you approach the word. And it's, it's rooted in my favorite word for this Bible study, which is dwell, dwell. And so if you want to write D-W-E-L vertically down your page, I'm going to give you uh, some ways to remember um, how to get into your Bible study and what, how to do that with, in a God-honoring way. And also a simple way if you're struggling. Like, how do I study the Bible? What do I, how do I approach it? So here we go. We discover. The, the idea of discovering in the Bible is it's something you probably learned in, in grade school. You start by finding out the basic details, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how, and all that, why it matters. And then another simple thing to do is just try to summarize it. If you can put it into one word or a phrase, and you'll hear me ask you to do that. I did that in this last lesson. Put it into one word, and it forces you to come up with a word, and you might be judging yourself. I don't know if I did the right word. Did you have a variety of words in your group? Was everybody's a pretty good idea? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's like you doing that work will help you come to it. So release yourself from worrying if I get it wrong. If you get it wrong, I will let you know. And so with other people in your group as well. But you probably are fine. And uh, you're learning and you're trusting God and have the Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> you're also going to ask questions. And that's a simple thing. You're going to wonder, D for discover, W for wonder, ask questions. What stands out here to me? Uh, what does this word mean? Um, what is God revealing here in this passage? I, I wonder how this even came to be and where was he when he was writing? All those are legitimate things to ask. And so be curious and have a sense of wonder as you're in the word. The next is to examine. And when we examine, we kind of look for repeats. If you see a word once that you think that's a cool, interesting word, and then you see it a second time, uh-oh, what's going on here? Do I have a pattern? And then you see it a third time, get your Sharpie out get your marker, whatever you're doing, and line it up in your Bible and connect because it's there for an important reason. It's very helpful to see those patterns. So look for those. And then you're going to see a flow. Um, When you're reading the Bible, you might all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, this is really an abrupt shift. What happened here? Check the flow. Is it, why is it happening? Why did it get abruptly mixed? And then you might even see a trigger word that helps you to see that the flow shifted. And that word is really important. The word is therefore and so when we see the word therefore we always ask what is it there for good job good job all right so we watch for the flow the next is 
the last is the two L's and the first is link. We talked about this in a previous message last year when I showed you a big, beautiful chart in a sense. They're showing you the hyperlinks from the foundational testament to the new. Remember how cool that was. You are going to do that. You have a Bible, hopefully, that has links in it, like hyperlinks. Those are called cross-references. They're going to link you to other passages, but you don't even need those because you're going to start to learn to recognize. You're going to see it in the Bible and go, I think I saw that someplace else. And then you're going to go look it up and you're going to go, look at me, I was right. And then you're going to go share it in the group. We're, we're all going to do, 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 good job. You did great. You did a great thing. So you're going to use your cross references and then you're going to link up and outside of scripture to worship. That's our link to the Lord, right? We connect to him through that worship full time. We make sure our worship is rooted in scripture and we use that as a way to connect us back as well. And our last L is live. That's the part we all want. We all, well, we all kind of want to start here, but we really need to be disciplined and learn to uh, live last. We got to get into the word and hear from God first. So living begins with confessing and repenting. Let the word redirect you away from Florence and Normandy. <laughs> Confess you were wrong and repent. Turn around, change directions, right? And then <clears throat> as a result of that, you grow and you have love. Right, you grow and you have love. Uh, you're going to see this quote I'm going to put up next. It's going to be in your, um, I think, day two of your Bible study. But I love this for a couple of reasons. This quote is sweet and it's visual. Helps you to picture what we're going to be doing in our Bible study, and it's significant because of who said it. And maybe you uh, recognize this this man's name. So Martin Luther said, uh, first we shake the whole tree to get the ripest fruit, but then we go branch by branch, twig by twig, even looking under each leaf. And that was his approach to Bible study. Martin Luther's life was entirely changed, literally changed, um, by reading Galatians. Uh, Martin Luther was not following God, and he was almost struck by lightning. And at that moment, he thought God was actually trying to kill him. This is in his biography. He thought God was trying to kill him. And, and so he said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give my life to God. What's the best way to do that? I'll become a monk, a Catholic priest. So he goes and becomes a monk, and um, he obeys all the laws and the rules, and he was completely overwhelmed and burdened by everything that was in um, being in that, in that life. <laughs> And uh, so much so was that his burden of uh, the weight of the sin and how he did not measure up to God and how he kept on having to do this and this and this, that he would go to confession two, three, four, five, fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty times wow. a day. Wait for it, a day, a day. So much so that his priest looked at him at one time and said, stop coming to confession unless you've committed fornication. Literally said that. That's committing adultery outside of your marriage. Okay. So don't come back. And... What ended up happening is Martin Luther read the book of Galatians and God gave him new eyes to see it and mm -hmm. he repented of all the legalism that the Catholic Church had put on him and as a result of that, he ended up being the actual reason why you are sitting in the chair you're sitting in today. Yeah. Because it wasn't for Martin Luther being convicted through uh, the book of Galatians um, that legalism was a massive travesty and a sin, um, then he would never have confronted the Catholic Church risked his life and nailed to the Wittenberg door his 95 statements or theses about where they were wrong and selling indulgences and all sorts of crazy nonsense oh, yeah. they were doing. Yeah. That's Martin Luther. Yeah. And it was, it was Galatians that changed his life, so much so he called Galatians his wife. He referred oh. to it as his wife. And, you know, I, I, you know, I put quotes up by authors because I, they, they're poignant and they stick, but we have to be careful. We don't we go to the word of God for our truth. Martin Luther had some significant challenges later in his life and fell into some serious sin. Um, however, we would not be here today if it weren't uh, standing on the shoulders of sinful people. I'm here today because of my dad. And, he, you know, he had his own struggles and all that. But I can still quote him and, and love because he loved um, the word and so did Martin Luther. So. Uh, we move through that. We are, we're thankful for men like Luther. And as we move through and dive into Galatians, we're going to see Paul's heart. We're going to see his heart for the gospel. We're going to want that same heart for ourselves. We're going to recognize, like hopefully, like I did, no, I don't have that heart. <laughs> I'm missing that. I need more of that. I, I'm as fiery as I am. I want more. <laughs> and uh, so Paul fought for that truth. And we're invited to do this exact same thing today. And we remember this, that Christian freedom is not the right to do as we wish. Christian freedom is the power to do as we should. That's being free. That is being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not the right to do as I wish. No rights have I, my dad wrote in a beautiful song. No rights. A slave of the Lord am I. How free am I because of that? Right? No rights have I. I, I, I surrender them all. And so as we go into Galatians, we remember 
that there are a variety of things in our life that can pull us away and and encourage us to um, minimize our faith and change the gospel but let me read this final quote to you here scripture never encourages us to minimize or turn a blind eye to matters like this instead we are commanded to contend earnestly for the faith the apostle paul uses no soft language in galatians 1 to address those who bring other gospels into the church he calls them accursed jesus does not treat lightly those who use the temple to peddle worldly goods for worldly gain he drives them out with a whip Christians should, of course, not stir up controversies or dissensions over minor disputable matters, but where clear distortion of scripture is taking place, we are not permitted to ignore it. And I wanted to, I want to close with this quote for a variety of reasons, because number one, I believe the Holy Spirit has brought us to this room to this day and given you the skills and understanding and the life experiences you need to, to embrace what we're going to be learning in this study. He's led you to this moment, and he's equipped you, and he's going to continue to do that. He did the same thing for me, um, because I don't read a lot outside of the Bible. That sounds way more spiritual than I meant it to, but I just kind of don't. I don't read a lot of fiction. I read nonfiction, but I just really just read the word. Um, and it's not just because it's my job. I, I just do. I always have. So I did end up having to uh, did end up um, reading a book uh, a few months ago, and it. It, the course corrected me in a lot of things. It gave me a great foundation for understanding things. And I was delighted as I was reading it while I was prepping this study and my studies through Galatians. I was delighted because it aligned perfectly with the things that we're going to be talking about. And I thought, aren't you so smart, God, that you knew this? <laughs> you inspired her to write that book. You inspired me to read it. I read it. I loved it. And I want to share it with you. I don't think in all the years I've ever taught here, I've ever recommended maybe one book to you. And I'm going to recommend this one very highly and don't do it at the expense of reading the word, but uh, enjoy it. And this quote is by a woman named Megan Basham, and she wrote an incredible book. Um, it's called Shepherds for Sale, How the Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda. And you might think, I don't want to read a book about politics. Oh, trust me, you want to read this book. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll leave it up here and we'll, we'll explain it later. But it's called Shepherds for Sale by Megan Basham. And here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. She writes, she, she writes to bring us in on point and basically exposes the, the fallacy of anyone thinking they're not, sus, uh, they're not um, susceptible. susceptible, thank you, they're not susceptible to the trap of legalism, the lie of legalism, and couching it in, in manners that make it look like, well, that's super churchy if I do that. I'm going to really recommend it. Again, please read the Bible. Read this if you have time. But here's the deal. At the end of this book, Megan shares her testimony, and she even confesses in the book that she doesn't really normally do that, but she went ahead and did it because it was someone pointing out actual truth in Scripture that changed her entire life. She was drug addicted, sect addict, basically, um, going to bars, getting arrested, and showing up in prison and with no memory of how she even got there. Um, she was living a life, running away from her parents, very much of a prodigal, and uh, she her her uh, Florence and Normandy turnaround moment happened because someone actually finally preached, gave her the truth and quit teaching a mamby pamby little sensitive and a wash your face girl type of gospel. They <laughs> really got in on her and actually told her the truth. And that changed her life. And she says in the book, if I had just kept on listening to all the nice feel-good stuff about how you've been a victim of this, and that's why you're the way you are. Here, have 10 more hours of therapy. Thank you very much. Write me a check. Buy myself a boat. You know, you get the gospel, and it completely frees you. It changes everything. So that's why I will recommend the book, because she points you to Scripture. Points you to Scripture. And I want to strongly encourage you to do that. So why? Why Galatians? Do you imagine, and you can guess who said this, uh, and when this was said, do you imagine that the gospel is a nose of wax? A little wax nose. You can just squeeze it and twist it. Shaped it into the suit of the face of each succeeding age. Is the revelation once given by the Spirit of God to be interpreted according to the fashion of the period? Was it said 20 years ago? 30? Sounds like a pretty high writing. 40? 70? 100? 137 years ago by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, wow, okay. Charles Spurgeon said that. We're living that today. 137 years later, everyone wants to twist the gospel and tweak it to make it fit what they want. So welcome to Galatians. We're going to have fun. We're going to learn a ton, as I like to say. And we're going to get into the answer to these questions. Why do we drift? Because we do from the gospel of grace. Am I trying to earn my way to God through good works? Because we do tend to do that. Am I living freely in Christ or am I still bound by guilt and legalism? Because we can do that as well. How can I overcome the struggle between the flesh 
and the spirit? How do I persevere in faith when I feel weary? Am I living in the freedom of Christ, relying on his grace and walking by the spirit each day? Each of those questions will be answered, I pray. And as a decorator crab will do, you'll take what you can and move forward and keep growing. And we'll all end up little, beautiful little decorator crabs by the end of the study <laughs> together. Amen? All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, once again, wow, your word is great. It's inexhaustible. And uh, we, we just love it. And it feeds us. And it reminds us of who we truly are in you. And we, I ask that, Lord, you would protect that in our heart. And we have a lot of distractions going into this week, a lot of reasons why we might not be able to get to this or get to that. I pray, God, we would fight to be in your word. And we would clear our entire schedules to just spend that time with you and really learn and grow and love it and share it and be better equipped to preach this gospel near and, and far and in little tiny soft whispers to people and big bellowing voices, whatever we need, God, that you would would equip us to do all of the above. Thank you once again for what you've done in my life, how you've changed me, how you've helped me to repent and see the error of my own ways and to come back to the beautiful simplicity of the gospel. And that's what we want to be about. And we thank you and praise you for that right now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Amen.